I want to preface this by saying that I've been going through a very rewarding and unexpected and holy time of growing in my life of prayer. And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about prayer. And um, tonight, tonight I'd like to look at uh, how Yeshua prayed. And uh, there's a reason why we should look at how Yeshua prayed and why we should pray like he prayed. And that reason can be seen by looking at this. We all know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And I'd like you to think of the fact that he came to be like us, that we might come to be like him. Let me say it again. Yeshua came to be like us in order that we might come to be like him. I'm afraid that uh, in my long years of association with the, the Yeshua believing world, sometimes one senses there are very trivial understandings of why Yeshua came. Some people feel that he only came uh, to suffer and die for our sins, which is not trivial. For us, it's not trivial. But to reduce Yeshua to being simply our kapora, simply our sacrifice, is to trivialize the whole coming of the Son of Man. Uh, some, for some people, their faith is all about voting the right way. The, you can tell somebody's faith is bona fide if they vote for the right causes in the right way and vote for the right party. Now, I'm not kidding, and I'm not accusing anybody here, but that kind of mentality exists out there. Now, why did the Messiah come? Well, for very great reasons. I mean, he came not only to redeem you and I as sinners, but he came to call together a people for his own namesake, from every people, tongue, tribe, and nation, from all who have ever lived, to a, a massive, massive representation of humanity because God is reclaiming a universe through Yeshua. He's come, he's come to reclaim the universe from the effects of sin. I've recently been thinking of it like this way. Uh, the, the whole universe was meant to be theocentric. It was meant to be centered around God. The whole universe was meant to be in orbit around God, around the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But instead, due to sin, the universe got out of orbit. It's no longer orbiting around the Holy One, and it's out of whack, and it's, it's, it's running down. It's going into entropy where the wages of sin is death. The fall is causing the death of all those connected with that universe, and uh, it's, it's going towards entropy where where everything is going to die, wither and die, the same as the physical universe is experiencing entropy. It's winding down. Of course, it'll be billions of years if Yeshua doesn't return before then, before it'll wind down. But it is winding down because it is, it is, uh, it is expiring. So Yeshua came uh, for a massive work of reclaiming all things visible and invisible. And in terms of ourselves, God says that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What God is up to in your life, in my life, in the lives of all the redeemed, is that he's looking to conform us to the image of his son. We read in scripture that when we, we do not know how he appears right now, but when we know, we know this, that when we see him, we will see him as, he, we will see him as he is, and we will be as he is. Uh, Yeshua said, it is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher. The goal of discipleship is for us to become like Yeshua not just morally, in every way. Yeshua told the disciples, 
go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature, immersing them, uh, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. Think for a moment. Do you think Yeshua was saying, teach them ethics? That's all he wants, teach them ethics. Teach them whatsoever I've commanded you. No, I believe he wants them, he wants us to teach people to become like Yeshua, to be depending upon the Holy Spirit as he did, to be pe people of whom it could be said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to, to the, the recovery of sight of the blind, and, and uh, to get, set the captives free, that we should be people whose, whose mission in life is no less, well, somewhat less, that's true, somewhat less, but greatly resembles the calling of Yeshua. He came to be like us, that we might come to be like him. He just didn't want to rescue our Turkishes from hell. He wanted to reclaim us to restore the image of God in fallen humanity. So let's talk. I believe that Yeshua's prayer life is a, an irreplaceable means towards advancing this work of being conformed to the image of God's Son. So when and how did Yeshua pray? I want to recommend to all of you that you read the Gospel of Luke and simply pay attention to all the little details in there and not so little details about Yeshua's prayer life. Because that's the greatest insight into Yeshua's prayer life that we have in the Bible is the good news according to Luke, Luke's Besorah. So here are some times that Yeshua prayed right after his immersion by Yochanan Amatbil, by John the Baptizer, in the Jordan River, we read that Yeshua was praying, and the Holy Spirit came down him, down upon him in the form of a dove, and a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. There we see all three persons of the Triunity represented, the Father, and the Spirit, and the Son. But notice that it was when Yeshua was praying that this dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit took place. You'll find in Luke that prayer and the Holy Spirit's empowerment are, are, are interwoven with each other. So it is that then when Yeshua goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary, before he meets with the adversary, he fasts and prays for 40 days. I used to think that he was fasting in order to weaken himself so that when he met the enemy and he was in victory over the enemy, it would be much, much more impressive that he did so when he was weakened by fasting. But no, no, no. Fasting is a means of spiritually strengthening yourself. He was strengthening himself in the spirit by fasting so that he would be able to meet the enemy um, successfully. So uh, that's the second thing we see in terms of Yeshua's prayer life. Uh, it's the way he fasted and prayed in the temptation in the wilderness. Then uh, what about withdrawal? You'll see in the good news of Luke that periodically Yeshua withdraws from the scene of action, from the huge crowds that are following him, even from the disciples. He withdraws and goes to a lonely place to pray. Why does he do this? He does it because prayer is a lifeline for him. It's a lifeline for him to, to touch base with the Father, to orient himself towards his mission, towards what he should be doing exactly. For instance, one time he spends the night in prayer and people come to him and they're begging him to stay because he, he'd been healing the day before. And now there are thousands of people coming from every village around who want him to stay. And he says, no, I can't stay. I have to go to the other villages because that's why I came out. That's a key to what he was praying for that night before he encounters them. He was praying to find out, Father, where should I be? What should I do? So prayer was a lifeline. He would often withdraw in order to pray 
and to be aligned with the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Spirit. We find him also praying uh, all night long before he chose the 12. He prayed all night long. He was praying about that choice. And then we see in today's reading, he prays, he's praying uh, with disciples of there, and then he turns around to them and he says, hi guys, who do people say that I am? Now, this was not a trivial question. Yeshua was trying to get to the point, to get to the point where he was going to ascertain, did the disciples know yet who he was? Had they put two and two together? So he says, who do people say that I am? Who does the crowd say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, one of the prophets. He says, but yes, you, who do you say that I am? And then Peter, Kepha, says, you're the Mashiach of God. We've just read that tonight. So he prays before he asks that big question. This is an important turning point in the story. How do we know it's important? Because right after Peter gives the right answer, then Yeshua tells them, fellas, the Son of Man is going, uh, is going to be betrayed and rejected by the elders. He's going to be crucified. He's, he's, he's going to be killed. He doesn't say crucified yet. He's going to be killed, and the third day is going to rise again from the grave. Well, he couldn't have told them that before then. It would have flipped them out. They had, he had to be at the point where he realized they have spiritually become insightful enough to know that this person they've been following is not just a great rabbi, even a great prophet. He's the Mashiach of God. And so then he pops this big question, but he prays before he asks it. He prays also for empowerment all throughout the Gospel of Luke. He's praying in order to gain power, in order to, to be filled with the Spirit. You know, he did not come upon us as God in a man suit. He didn't come uh, like an imitation of a human being. He's really God, but he looks like a human being. No, 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 no. He became a human being. And Yeshua didn't minister out of his own uh, deity. He didn't minister out of his intrinsic godness. He emptied himself, it says in Philippians. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself of these divine prerogatives so that he functioned as, an, as the God's obedient man son. That's what he functioned as. And he needed to be empowered by the Spirit. We read in one occasion uh, that he was somewhere and it says, the power, uh, the power of the Lord was present to heal. Uh, that, that God's power was present to heal. That means that there were some times when perhaps when Yeshua's ability, his, his readiness to heal was not as potent. So it ebbed and flowed and Yeshua was dependent upon his connection with the Father in order for him to do all the work that he did. That's true of you. That's true of me. Um, that's why I'm saying all of this. This is not just a study in Yeshua, but it's a foretaste of the kinds of factors that need to be operative in our lives if we're going to have a prayer life like his. Number seven, guidance. He prayed for guidance. He said in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, he said, I only do what I see the Father doing. So he was tracking with the Father all the time. And he says in another place, I, I, I only say the words that I speak are not my own, but I say what the Father told me. So he was very closely tracking with the Father, and he did that in prayer. Lastly, this kind of ties it all up. He stayed in an atmosphere and in a, uh, in a behavior and a, of prayer in order that he could work smarter and not just harder. He only had a few years uh, to do the work that he did. You know, he didn't start this work until he was over 30. And he only had a few years. So he, he needed to work smarter and not just harder. And he did that by staying close to the Father. So there are many things that we can learn 
about Yeshua's prayer life here, but I'd like to look at one underlying foundation of all of this, an underlying foundation, and that is Yeshua's worldview. A worldview is your foundational perspective on reality and yourself. It's what you intrinsically, what you intuitively believe is real, what is unreal, what what is reality, and what is your place in reality. What is reality, and what is your place in reality? That's your worldview. I want to show you four aspects of Yeshua's worldview, and I want to recommend to all of us that we make his worldview ours, because this is the foundation of his prayer life. And if we will make this worldview ours, it will inform a life of prayer that in some way resembles that of Yeshua. And remember, he came to be one of us, that we would come to be like him. So let's look at these four aspects of his worldview. First, his view of God's power. Yeshua believed that nothing was impossible for God. Once he's teaching and he's talking about the rich man entering the kingdom of heaven and how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples say, well, well, then who, Lord, can be saved? And Yeshua says, with man it's impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. He also says, uh, when, when Jairus, I believe, when Jairus comes to him for healing of his daughter, and he says to him, if you can, please heal my daughter. And Yeshua says to him, if you can, he says, all things are possible to him who believes. Why? Because we believe in a God who can do anything. It's not our faith that heals. Our faith is only as potent as the object of the faith. If I have faith in a flower pot, it's not going to do very much good. So first foundation of Yeshua's worldview was that he felt, believed, was convinced, knew that God, his Father, was all-powerful, could do anything. Foundation of his worldview. Number two, he had a sense of his place. Remember, a worldview is a foundational perspective on reality and yourself. So Yeshua had a sense of what his place was in the world, that he was the father's son and his servant. When the, uh, uh, when the voice comes from heaven after, after his immersion, it says, this is my beloved son, hear him. At the Mount of Transfiguration, again, he's identified as God's son. He knows from his mother that the angel had come and told him that he's going to give birth, and this one, this one will be the, the Messiah, the Son of God. So he knew he was God's son, and he knew that he was God's servant. He knew he was the suffering servant. So as a son, he was occupied in bringing honor to his father. That's the job of a son, to see that the father is honored. And that's our job as children of God. We should be people who project the honor of God, who honor God in our lives, and who are quick to act when God is being dishonored. That's part of our filial, as sons and daughters of God, our filial uh, uh, responsibility. But as servants, our, our responsibility, of course, is to obey God. Yeshua knew himself to be a child, of, to be the son of God, the only begotten son of God and to be God's servant, and that's how he conducted himself. That's the second aspect of his worldview, the way he saw reality and his place in reality, serving a, an omnipotent God as son and servant, and we would serve as sons and daughters and servants. Number three, Yeshua had a sense of what God's project was. He knew somehow what God was up to in the world. God is up to, as I said earlier, reclaiming a whole cosmos from the entropy and the contamination of sin. Uh, the cosmos uh, is in a kind of trouble that cannot be solved by science. 
because it's a spiritual disaster. The fall is what caused the whole universe to be out of joint. Uh, Paul says that the whole creation is groaning and and, and, and looking toward entering into the, the fullness that the children of God are entering into. The whole universe is groaning because it's not yet where it needs to be. So Yeshua knew that God was reclaiming humanity for his namesake. He knew that God was redeeming the cosmos. He knew that God was in a, in a program of vanquishing and, and victory over all the forces of darkness. I tend to think of the demonic realm, the satanic realm. I just thought of this metaphor recently. It's kind of like viruses and bacteria in this respect. It's one thing if you have a wound, and all of us have been wounded. It's one thing if you have a physical wound, but if it gets infected by a virus or a bacterium, it can cause tremendous pain and even death. The demonic realm is like spiritual viruses and bacteria, although the demons have personality. They have very fixated personalities. There's not a well-rounded personality. They're, they're, they're obsessed with certain sinful behaviors and attitudes that they feed off of, just like viruses and bacteria can migrate to certain kinds of wounds, certain organs. That's where the demonic realm is. And Yeshua knew God's project was the vanquishing of the demonic realm, bringing health to the whole cosmos, redeeming the cosmos from the effects of sin. He knew that. So he knows so far three things. The fourth thing, uh, he knows that the problem, the root problem of all of this is spiritual. Paul knew this too. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our problem is not flesh and blood. He could also say in our day, well, he would say our problem is not technological. It's not educational. Uh, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the, the spiritual forces, of, co cosmic forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, cosmic forces of evil. That's what the root problem in the universe is a spiritual problem. Yeshua knew that. So he knew four things. He knew that God's power was omnipotent. He knew his place as God's son and God's servant. He knew that God's project was redemptive, was reclaiming humankind, reclaiming the universe, reclaiming everything and bringing everything back into the condition that it never should have fallen out of. And he knows that the problem in the universe is not technological, it's not historical, it's not cultural. At the root, it's spiritual. And therefore, the weapon, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual to the casting down of strongholds. So he knew this, and we should know it too. We should make this worldview our construct, focusing on the power of God, on our place in God's plan, the nature of what God's up to in the world, and the recognition that as the problem is spiritual, so our equipment must be spiritual. And that's why we need to pray, because we cannot access the power of the Spirit or be guided by the Spirit as Yeshua was, unless we have the help of the Spirit. And we have to pray. So, the Word became flesh. He came to be like us, that we might come to be like Him. I believe that. I hope you do too. Here are three things to remember. Adopt Yeshua's worldview. Pray as He prayed, that you might live as He lived. As you go to your um, breakout groups, I want you to think of those four aspects of worldview and also think about the question, 
is Crazy Stewart right in saying that the Messiah came, became flesh, and came to be like us? He came taking on the form of humankind, that he might, that we might come to be like him? Is that part of the whole plan? Think about these things, and may God be with us all. Shabbat Shalom.